What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here from Datadash and today is March 20th of 2023. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's episode, we've got a jam-packed Macro Monday where we're not only gonna be diving into the price action for Bitcoin, giving some thoughts on where things are gonna be heading here in the short term, as well as Ethereum's price action. But on top of that, we've gotta talk about everything going on in the macro sphere from UBS acquiring credit suites and what it means for the broader financial system and also talk about the broader performance in equities, central bank monetary policy, other dominoes that are likely to fall, and the overall narrative that I want you guys to focus on. There's a lot of talk about hyperinflation and Bitcoin going to a million dollars, and I want to give you guys the down-to-earth view. I think there's a lot of euphoria here, and it is typical with every single relief rally we find in bear markets, irrespective of it being crypto, equities, the housing market, you name it. We got a lot of things to sit down and talk about today. So if you guys enjoy the rambling, drop a like. It's one of the best ways you guys can support the channel. And let's go ahead and kick things off. So I want to go ahead and start off here with talking about what's on everyone's mind at the moment, and that is Bitcoin. Now, as we talked about in our kind of devil's advocate video, where we tried to think about the more bullish perspective, or at least try to understand if Bitcoin continues to climb in price during this wave of euphoria, where can it realistically go to? And while everyone is throwing out these really crazy price targets, talking about people fleeing from the banking system, again, as much as that narrative definitely resonates home with the original purpose of Bitcoin trying to be this digital store of value, I think we've seen over about a decade's worth of practice that during some of the worst capitulative events, Bitcoin heavily underperforms. And in fact, gives up a lot of the gains and usually bleeds out during periods of fear and uncertainty. Rather does really good during periods of major central bank balance sheet expansion. And I know some of you are pointing towards the recent expansion, which we'll talk about later on, but I wanna talk about why it's a bit different this time around. So just hang with me here. Now, the big thing I wanna talk about is as we discussed, we do believe that Bitcoin could chop in this range for a couple months, and it's going to look as if it's starting to build a higher based foundation with the instability and the banking system. Here, we might get some deviations, uh, you know, generally through this range, but eventually we're going to be making the case here that we're going to face resistance at this range. Why is that? Well, if we turn on our indicators here, take a look at the daily time frame. This is the first major significant volume profile for this entire period of sideways price action. And as we can see, time and time again, this is where sellers started to come in. This is the price action concept indicator. It's a part of the Lux Algo indicator suite we use here on the channel. It's one of the few indicators I like to use as a macro trader because on those daily or weekly time frames, these type of things will let you know where price is likely to retest as time progresses. If you get to certain points in price, chances are you're likely to come up and retest those ranges and eventually it's going to face resistance. That liquidity is gonna be absorbed. It's gonna be difficult for price to clear through though. These are significant points that you can watch for on your chart. And while you can use Luxalgo on pretty much any asset class or any time frame, I recommend sticking to utilizing it on crypto and equities and using it on those daily or weekly timeframes. So if you guys are interested in utilizing these kind of tools, definitely check out the description down below where you guys can get a link to buy the Luxo indicators with 30% discount code using DD30. So again, just a really interesting indicator suite in my opinion. And I think it's also important to watch how it plays out on Ethereum, right? As Ethereum could likely come up here to this significant volume profile range with an 18% reading. Again, same exact case scenario here where we see more sellers coming in. This is exactly where we faced resistance in August of 2022. And this is again, during that period of time where we were selling our positions, going back into cash. Now again, another typical sign here of long-term weakness is that ETH is not leading here. ETH is continuing to fall back. And it's at, at its lowest point against Bitcoin when it comes to the ETH to BTC ratio since back in July. Not a really good sign if we're seeing the kind of risk on mentality here of crypto assets, right? So altcoins, I would stay away from. If you are making any bullish bets, should be in Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin, again, is riding off at the air now that it's gonna be this liquidity vortex and it's gonna be the hedging asset. Another thing that I think is important to watch when we're doing our crypto analysis, and yet again, is a 
tip in favor of the bulls is the cumulative volume delta, which is finally, finally, yet again, as we saw during uh, mid last week, where right? we haven't seen officially two weeks from Monday just yet that have been positive flips. We looked at it in, um, in the middle of last week, but we have yet again, another weekly seven day positive reading on the CVD. And I gotta be honest with you guys, that's some good market order flow. All right, this is the kind of things we would see on the counter side, usually when it was negative around 20,000, that would usually be the reading you would get during a weekly capitulative down move. So again, for those who have been in long positions, for those who bought their positions or have been trying to trade this, that's great. Congrats to you guys. You've been on the right side of the trade here since back in November, if you've been buying during this period of time. Hats off to you. Must give credit where it's due. I'm totally fine to admit that we didn't make this trade. But the important thing here that I want to talk about as we go throughout this broader macro conversation and come back towards this topic of the hyperinflation that's supposedly going to come and the collapse of the banking system that everyone is discussing, I want to go ahead and talk about why I think this is, again, just another relief rally, another narrative, another, oh, the Fed is going to come in and save the day kind of situation. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about it here. So first thing we got to discuss is the performance in equity markets. Uh, one of the big indicators that I recommend people watch that a lot of people you generally don't watch or one of the indices that I recommend you watch is the Russell 2000. This is the small cap index. So whereas the Dow Jones tracks the 30 largest industrial or you know, base, basically largest traded equities, publicly traded equities in the United States. Outside of that, you also have the Russell or RUT, which is an ind index that tracks a lot of the small caps. This has been one of the weaker performing links within the broader stock market. It's down to where it was back in October and it looks like it wants lower levels. That is mainly due to the situation in the regional banks. And again, these are two indices that I would recommend you guys keep an eye on here because this is an already known problem and we don't know how far this banking issue is going to continue. But outside of that, no matter how this continues, we also have contagion across the globe. We've got UBS coming in and saving the day for Credit Suisse with a $3.2 billion acquisition as regulators are continuing to step in. And on top of that, have provided a whopping 100 billion Swiss francs or $108 billion line of credit to the bank in order to stabilize its balance sheet and continue commercial lending activities. Now, this has basically made UBS overnight the biggest bank in Switzerland by far. Uh, it is now a dominant player after acquiring its rival Credit Suisse, which had a very different balance sheet and its own respected issues. But I want to go ahead and talk about why this is a big deal, because a lot of people say, you know, this is good news. Some people say it's bad news. I just want to go ahead and address the point here that is relevant for us in the crypto space. I know a lot of people say that this is a domino effect that's just going to destroy the banking system. The banking system's going to have a major bank run. People are losing faith in the banking system, and therefore Bitcoin's going to go up. What I'd rather focus on is, I think, the more relevant argument here for all asset markets, which is that Credit Suisse just back a couple months ago, really, if you want to take it back even two years ago, right? Credit Suisse was worth more than 10 times what it's being valued at as of the acquisition here, right? The valuation is actually going to come in at around 50 cents per share. So to kind of put that in perspective from the close on Friday, this dropped from around $2 per share down to 50 cents. So anyone who was buying the dip, trying to hold the bag on Credit Suisse, that's a hefty loss. If you bought Credit Suisse throughout any period of time over the past couple of months, going back in February was around $14 per share. That was a 28 times multiple, roughly speaking, from the acquisition price. Billions of dollars of equity value has faded here, right? The company was valued about $8 billion just back, back here. The close on Friday, well, basically acquired by a, about 2 to $3 billion now. So what does that mean here, right? The depositors are all good. No situation there. So there's no bank run. The depositors are all good to go. The government is not going to allow for this to happen. 
So who really loses here? Equity investors, asset holders, those who had equity positions for these commercial banks. And we can already see Credit Suisse has been a weak link for some time. People knew it had issues, right? If we take a look at the longer term performance of UBS, you can see very clearly that even though it has declined here in the short term, as with most banking stocks, UBS has been a well-respected player. And you can tell why that is because of its financial statements. Very different, right, on an annual or quarterly basis versus that of, say, Credit Suisse. However, if we zoom out here, even the defensive banks, right, are starting to show weakness in price and are fading that equity value. Anything that signals an absolute collapse, no, nothing that bad, but we are seeing equity value diminish. So this is somewhere in the middle. It's not a happy sunshine and rainbow situation where everything's going up and everything's great and the Fed is printing tons of liquidity to support asset markets. And it's also not this disaster situation where the entire banking system is collapsing. So what does that likely mean? Well, I think we can see very clearly as Asian markets opened up today, equities are sliding by 3%. The Hang Seng Index is continuing a continued decline since back in January, late January, where most equities topped at the time. So what's this telling us here? What's well, telling us that even though the Federal Reserve, yes, as many people have pointed out, I will show it here on the chart for those of you who may have not seen it just yet. The Fed injected about $300 billion of liquidity, taking us back on the balance sheet reduction plan back to where we were back in November. And Many people have made the argument that this is just the beginning. This is QE light, or more specifically, that the Fed is going to really start ramping up their quantitative easing efforts to stop an absolute banking collapse. But I have to tell you guys, this is probably the vast majority of what the Fed is going to be able to do. And it, alongside other central banks, are likely going to continue tightening and contracting liquidity. If we take a look here, at the global central bank liquidity, right? We need to focus on what's happening here between the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan. Because these trillions of dollars of base money supply are going to determine the direction of asset markets. And sure, maybe this little injection helps equities for a week or so. You guys wanna trade that? That's totally fine. But I'm wondering whether or not these central banks have the guns to be able to come out and print trillions of dollars of liquidity to drive another asset bubble a real bull market. Can the Fed really do this? Can the ECB, where economies like Germany are facing double digit inflation still at this moment, after all the tightening that central banks have done, after the contraction of global liquidity that we've seen since really the turn in 2022? I don't think so. And in fact, the ECB themselves Many of the different types of members of the ECB, even Christine Lagarde herself, has stated that, yeah, there may be issues going on in the financial sector right now, but we are continuing our tightening efforts. So this makes it very clear that we are somewhere in that middle position. Yes, there are some banks failing. This is all part and parcel with the liquidity contraction process. Weak links like Credit Suisse should go under and go through a restructuring process. Regional banks who overexposed themselves to mortgage-backed securities who didn't consider the fact of liquidity potentially being locked or more specifically those mortgage-backed securities losing value. Yeah, their investors are unfortunately going to face insurmountable losses and there will be a restructuring process for those banks. Depositors will be insured. People will go about living their lives day by day as it was before. Everyday people in that sense. However, the investors and assets are making a huge mistake by being exposed to these companies and are going to face the penalties for it. That is what happens during liquidity contractions. And you can see that this has a ripple effect across the performance of the broader asset markets. Strong links, weak links, doesn't matter. We can see that on the broader trend of things, the Dow Jones, the 30 largest companies, have been continuing to underperform since back in November. The S&P 500 has continued to move lower since again, that same range we talked about on the Hang Seng Index here towards the close of January, it has been moving down here, continuing to set in lower price levels week by week. And there's a big reason for this. It's because we're preparing for a recession, right? 
irrespective of what goes on in the banking industry, that's probably one of the big catalysts or dominoes for this downward pressure. We're going into an earnings recession. Companies are not going to have the same kind of consumer spending that they had over the last decade. Why is that? Because the Fed is contracting liquidity. People have maxed out their credit cards. They have maxed out loans and available ways to take on debt to go spend in the economy. And now, once that liquidity dries up, if the Fed continues on its job and continues tightening to address the real problem in our financial system, which is persistent and sticky inflation, then things are going to get a lot more ugly for asset prices before they get better. And again, I want to lean back into this talking point. Do you guys think Bitcoin can just be this total separate diverged asset? Maybe it can, perhaps. But we need to talk about this topic of the liquidity trap as we go through our conversation. One last thing I want to talk to you guys about, we wrote in the Dash report some weak links that are likely coming up for the swing of bankruptcy and restructuring the cruise liners as well as the airlines. Take a look here at CCL or Carnival Cruises down back where it was in March of 2020, rolling over any gains it had in 2021 going into 2022 and showing absolute signs of weakness. This is at its lowest price point since back in June of 1993, or the same price level we saw then doesn't look good for Carnival Cruises. Its financials look even worse. On top of that, you have some of the stronger cruise lines like Royal Caribbean, still financials looking incredibly weak and yet again, setting in a lower high. Now, again, if we look back at the last two bear markets, this takes us down here into 2008 territory and 01 territory at around 12 to $13 a share. At current valuations, that's another $16 billion company that's going to be losing billions upon billions of dollars of value. People who thought they had that wealth will no longer have it because the clear value of those shares will be declining in an earnings recession where these companies already are under significant pressure and losing money still. This is not a good sign. The airlines as well look incredibly weak. They've been continuing to make lower highs since back in February of 2018. And this again signifies that these companies, whether or not they maybe start to have some positive financials, are going to be affected by an earnings recession and are going to take years and years to build a bullish case scenario like they did for the last decade during easy money. Again, when we trade on the side of the Fed, that's when the easy money comes. That's when the good times are. But if the Fed can't really come in with the guns, then we are going to face broader losses. And this trend is happening across the board for airlines, even as fuel costs are going down. So those kind of small narratives that, you know, again, we usually get people really excited. That's the kind of stuff that will get you trapped in bad trades. And now I want to go ahead and talk about this last topic here. Now, you guys might know Balaji. He was the original uh, CTO at Coinbase. And, you know, to be honest, irrespective of this bet, I've actually really liked following Balaji over the years. Um, I, I really have nothing against this kind of broader content. He's a, a big Bitcoin advocate, probably did a lot of great for the space over the past couple of years. But I, I got to tell you guys, uh, while I definitely respect him supposedly putting his money up to the table, it's better than a lot of people just making predictions and sharing their opinions. I got to tell you guys, I think this is a little bit disingenuous here. Bellagio has come out and essentially with a guy named James Medlock come out and placed a bet where essentially he has put up um, a million USDC uh, if that basically if he loses, right, he would be uh, losing that million USDC if Bitcoin does not go up to a million dollars in the next nine days. If it does, on the other hand, he not only gets to keep his million USD, but on top of that, he gets Bitcoin, like this one Bitcoin from James Merlock. So that's the general kind of thesis of this bet, essentially a 40 to one odd bet for um, you know the other party versus Balaji. And look, I understand, hey, this is definitely a bold bet. He's putting up his money to it. Can't give him much criticism there. But I, I have to say that these kind of things can be used as narratives to drive major retail 
waves of liquidity absorption. And I'm not saying Balaji maybe is the actor doing this, but I gotta be real with you guys. These are the kind of narratives that can sucker a lot of people into buying leverage positions on Bitcoin, chasing the hyper Bitcoinization theory that, you know, again, the super cycle. Remember that narrative that everyone was told by, by Suzu and all these people in the crypto space who told us it's just gonna go to a million dollars. Really? Is the banking system in that bad of a state, guys? And again, I don't get where all these these narratives are coming from. You know, people have these slight, minute, different discrepancies in how they see things. Oh, they think that the you know Fed's just going to come in, save the markets, and we're just going to go supersonic. You know, some people believe that the Fed is going to do nothing and it's just going to collapse the financial system. Guys, extremes like these are not the ones you want to be chasing. Usually the vast majority of the time throughout history, somewhere in the middle. And it's likely going to be a scenario where Bitcoin's got the steam to possibly come up into this channel. Fair to admit that here, that we missed this trade. I'll say that here, but I got to tell you guys this. These are the kind of narratives that allow people to get trapped in a sideways channel buying trades during this period of time and large institutional investors distribute on them. If you look at the vast majority of on-chain analytics right now about who's buying, right? if this is really a banking collapse, you'd wanna be seeing those institutional large-scale investors buying up Bitcoin, they're flat to non-existent right now. In fact, on the other side of it, we're seeing a lot of retail volume. And I got to tell you guys, while at the end of the day, retail volume can have an effect, it can drive up prices. We are definitely seeing here, right? It's definitely playing a role. This is the perfect opportunity at a heightened price level to allow people who had positions they were stuck in to now finally offload on the market and absorb that liquidity. I want to go ahead and close off here by featuring just a little snippet of the end of our February Dash Report newsletter. And this is something that I wrote at the time as a closing remark. It's the last page of the article. Uh, again, if you guys want to get access to the Dash Report, there's a link down below in the description. It's our monthly newsletter. But I wanted to go ahead and give you guys a little bit of a taste of what we've been saying since back in late January, okay, when we were writing the newsletter. The caption of this last kind of segment of the newsletter Got a very interesting photo of Jay Powell here sitting at the Fed table. Place your bets now, ladies and gentlemen. I feel that the big trade is upon us. And unlike the general market, I don't think it'll be decided by any comments or changes from the Fed during the current FOMC meeting or the upcoming FOMC meeting. In other words, I don't think we'll start rallying or crashing off of tomorrow's developments. The Fed's mandate of getting inflation down to 2% hasn't changed. And until it does, we should continue we should continue to take advantage of short term waves of optimism while also understanding that the euphoria can continue on to dramatic lengths because of people's inclinations to focus on the best case scenario 24/7 the thing that most aren't telling you is that they're willing to tighten until something breaks something will likely spook asset markets and fully stun consumer demand and as many have pointed out over the last few decades when the Fed loosened monetary policy, when they dropped rates and ramped up QE, it's the exact moment equities began to descend into a free fall, not rebound. I want to make that very clear. COVID, the 2020 spur, was a doubling of the money supply. And that did lead into an inversion on how equities perform versus the broader economy. It left towards a huge discrepancy. But when we see pivots, this is usually the pivotal moment, no pun intended, where equities and assets drop substantially due to the Fed's response signaling something has broken in the financial system. The Fed will step in when it's necessary to do so to save the economy, not when people simply want them to. We've been promptly building short positions, excuse me, we will be promptly building short positions and start buying puts on overvalued tech names if and when we see the momentum showing signs of weakness later in Q1. But we are in no rush. 
equities and crypto markets will likely squeeze more shorts and over leverage participants first and sucker in as many retail traders as possible to go long in in order to strip financial markets of as much excess liquidity as possible during the process. This plays into the topic of the liquidity trap, which we talked about before in the Dash report and on this channel, where essentially the Federal Reserve is able to utilize financial assets and institutional investor liquidity to absorb retail liquidity at a higher price, leaving them to face losses, face liquidations, all types of mechanisms to absorb a lot of that excess money from COVID. That is a part of the job. The last decade was characterized by easy money and led to a blow off top of grand proportions. Now with monetary policy contracting, a rapidly changing global supply chain, and an imbalance in global relations, the 2020s will unfortunately be a period that brings contractionary forces as we have faced in the past. A slowdown in the pace of innovation, slower economic projections, and demographical challenges. Simply buying the dip may very well no longer work for years to come, and only those who can counter the emotional crowd will come out on top making life-changing returns in the process. But this relies on making the difficult decisions when no one else is willing to and being patient until those opportunities actually present themselves. The name of the game is to trade with the Fed because they dictate inflows and outflows more than any actor in financial markets. Trade with them during pivotal moments everyone doubts them and watch the money flow. Trade against them and you will likely have to pay the price. Stay safe out there everyone. So I want to make something very clear here, guys. While yes, we've definitely missed some bumps in trades. Heck, you could even make the argument here um, that you know we could have sold at a higher price, this or that, talking hypotheticals all day long. For those of you who are here this far into the video, all you need to ask yourself is whether or not you're here for the next bull market or if you're here to trade. If you're here to trade left and right and trade off every short-term move and try to trade on leverage, so be it. There are tons of YouTube channels out there that will promote you referral links, will make money when you get liquidated for over trading, and will try to make you move on every single opportunity, leading you to think mentally that if you don't make that trade, you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on hyper Bitcoinization. You're going to struggle from hyperinflation and lose your entire life savings because somehow the United States is just going to collapse tomorrow. Yeah. Like we haven't heard that a dozen times already over the past decade. When the financial system completely cratered in March of 2020, when we had our prior bear market or kind of short-term scare bear market back in 2018, 2008 as well, an entire collapse in the housing industry. Well, the system did not collapse then. And it's probably a very good thing it didn't. What we've realized now is Bitcoin is not this, you know, alternative hedge that people rush to during panicking times. People want food, they want resources. We saw that in March of 2020. They did not want Bitcoin. On the other end of the spectrum, Bitcoin is this great hedge during periods of time of monetary expansion. When the base money supply depreciates rather than when there's deflation or slowing growth, right? When there's exuberant growth, optimism, lots of excess liquidity, risk on assets like Bitcoin do well as this kind of hedge to be able to, you know, basically grow your wealth alongside the balance sheet. That's the name of the game. And while I respect Bellagio and many people within the Bitcoin community, I think we can get chopped up by our own narratives. And that is exactly what the Fed wants you to do. They want you to put any excess money you have into these assets so that they can get the liquid money supply, the money that's used for goods and services, out of the economy and into financial markets where people will lose it inevitably. And that goes in the hands of institutional investors who, if they double their net worth from say $10 million to $20 million, they're not gonna spend any more or less than they would have probably back then. And instead of everyday people having $10 million and doubling to 20 million who would go and spend it in the economy, losing that capital and allowing the Fed to get back towards an equilibrium of supply and demand, to get inflation back down to its 2% target. That mandate has not changed. And the comments from the ECB and other central banks across the world make it clear that the Fed still has to do its job. It still has to be able to keep interest rates suspended for a prolonged period of time. Maybe they aren't gonna raise interest rates, 
But this kind of environment, if we live in this high interest rate environment, if we don't see the Fed coming in and printing tons and tons and tons of money like they did back in 2020, what's going to save asset prices? And especially what is going to save Bitcoin when all the on ramps are getting destroyed, when there is not that kind of excess money in the system? We are still seeing generally liquidity contraction or a base money supply that's neutral. I'm not here to say that Bitcoin can't move a little bit higher. I'm only here to say that I really don't believe that we're in for the next bull market. It's just my candid take, guys. I'm not here to speak in absolute terms, guys. I'm not saying you can't have some exposure. Have a little bit if you're really worried about hyperinflation. You'll be hedged. That's the idea of a hedge. You know, you have like, you know, anywhere from one to ten percent exposure to gold or Bitcoin. And if the system collapses, hey, you're all good to go. Doesn't mean you need to be all in. So anyways, guys, I don't mean to be too negative. Just trying to be realistic. I want to help you guys protect and preserve your capital. I don't want to speak in absolutes like so many people do in crypto with predictions. I want to be trying to be realistic, try to find a middle ground and protect ourselves more than anything. Think about what you can afford to lose rather than what you can afford to make. That's it for today's video, guys. If you guys enjoyed this video, drop a like. If you guys want to get access to some of the tools we talk about here on the channel, like Lux Algo or BookMap, we've got discount codes down below in the description. They're great tools you can add to your arsenal. But if you enjoyed the rambling again, drop a like, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care, everyone.